Hello there and welcome to Point of View. I'm Mark Leishman and a sobering insight ahead for you. Now by the end of this year more than 5,700 Kiwis will have been diagnosed with a form of gut cancer. That's 15 people every day of the year and worryingly an increasing number of them are from rural New Zealand. So what's being done to fight this disease and why are so many Kiwis who live in the country being affected? Well to join me uh, to elucidate on that topic on Point of View is the Gut Cancer Foundation's Executive Officer Liam Willis. Liam, welcome to the program and thanks uh, for sharing your time. Well, thank you Mark, I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss these topics with you. Thanks for having us. Well tell us about yourself first up and I guess your journey to the Gut Cancer Foundation. Yeah sure, so you, you might be able to tell I'm, I'm uh, not from New Zealand originally, I'm from Manchester in the UK, um, but been here for 11 years. Um, my background is is in fundraising for non-profits both in the UK and in New Zealand um, and I've been with the Gut Cancer Foundation for um, coming on three years now as the executive officer here so it's my responsibility to um, run the strategy and roll the strategy out for the organisation, grow the organisation, raise the funds necessary to fund research and, and, and awareness into these uh, these very prevalent cancers. So you say cancers, there's the Gut Cancer Foundation, there's more than one the cancer of course that will, will potentially will get you. Yeah, so look, when, when we talk about gut cancers, what we're talking about are the cancers that affect the digestive system. So um, that is esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, liver, gallbladder, pancreatic, and bowel colorectal cancer. So uh, clinically, they are known as gastrointestinal cancers, um, but they can be, uh, uh, the term we use is, is gut cancers. So as you rightly pointed out, though, that collectively, um, this group of cancers is, is actually the most common in New Zealand. Um, 15 people a day, 5,700 people every year will um, that be diagnosed with one form of, of gut cancer. That's an extraordinary number, isn't it, for a country our size? And I mean, obviously, serious uh, issues. Uh, what impact do they have on people across New Zealand? Yeah, look, it's really serious. The, the problem we have with, with cancers of the digestive system, we've got a really um, bad combination here, Mark. So as we've already alluded to, they are very prevalent, the most prevalent forms of cancer. But what we're looking at as well are, are forms of cancer that have really, in some instances, very low survival rates, five-year survival rates. In particular, when we're looking at those cancers that are the upper digestive system, so esophageal geal, gallbladder, pancreas, liver, stomach as well. And for example, pancreatic cancer, um, if you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, you actually only have 12% uh, survival rate after five years for anybody that's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which is it's the lowest. So we're dealing with a, a set of cancers that are very prevalent, but also a set of cancers that really struggle for treatment options and are difficult to treat and diagnose, which means that we have some of the worst survival rates as well out of, of any of the cancers that we, that we face in New Zealand. Now I alluded at the beginning of the program that uh, you know the rural sector is seemingly more prone so what is the reason behind gut cancer and farmers and the farming community? Well, look I think it's really important to note that, that, that these cancers don't discriminate so urban, rural, everybody is susceptible and there are a number of potential factors that could increase our risks to, to gut cancers. Um, I think something that's really important to point out is that one of the key things to survival for these cancers is, is early diagnosis. And, and early diagnosis is about often, it's about spotting the symptoms and understanding the symptoms early enough to get presented to a doctor so that treatment can begin before the cancer had, has spread. Now, one of the main issues with, with cancers of the digestive system, these these symptoms that we're talking about are often not particularly pleasant. They're not particularly things that we want to address. We're talking about things like change of bowel habits, blood in the stool, pale stools, and they can be quite um, uh, difficult to assess as well. And, and they can be a little bit vague. So things like pain in the abdomen, lower back and unexplained tiredness, these kind of things are really some of the main symptoms around these cancers. And what may I think be, be prevalent in, in, the, in the rural society, particularly perhaps in the farming community, your viewers are often outside. They're often working hard, long days on, on the farm or in, 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 out, outdoors with, with physical activity. Uh, and it may be a generalisation to say, I'm not sure, but perhaps, you know, there is often the need just to grit your teeth and get through. 
Mm. We're going to have pain. We're going to have aches. We're going to have bad backs. You know, we just get on with it because that's what we have to do to get through our day, you know. Mm. However, with these kind of cancers, it's so important to recognise when perhaps that pain is a bit different or it's not going away and it's prolonged, you know, or there's something going on that isn't quite right and understanding your body, that means we don't just grit our teeth and ignore it. That means we recognise it and we do something about it and that something about it is is taking ourselves to the doctor and saying, just look, I'm not sure that something might be a bit amiss here, so can, can we get it checked out? It's quite interesting really with the uh, now a, a real predominance of uh, thought about mental health, particularly in the rural uh, sector. Uh, it's now become such a thing that it's not, it's almost considered like a, a form of cancer, mental health. And it's interesting how we're now more open to talking about that. Um, and perhaps we need to become much more open about, you know, these other issues. And perhaps some of the, as you say, the subjects that aren't necessarily that easy to talk about. Yeah, look, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and it's something that is prevalent across all elements of, of, of society and community and what may be a particular relevance to people in the rural community, Mark, is, it, is that willingness to speak up on, on issues of our own body and, and issues that usually we would try and rub them, you know, um, put under the carpet and we don't want to talk about them. It might be a bit icky, it might be things to do with going to the toilet and bleeding from our bottom and these kind of things, which, you know, they're, they're things that traditionally perhaps we we, we just ignore or... or yeah, we, we don't want to bring up with other people, but it's absolutely vital that they are talked about and that they're, they're normalised. You know, we, what, one of the things that we want to try and do is, is decrease the stigma. And I think that's part of the problem that we have, is that there is a stigma to some of these symptoms. Um, and well, that, whether that's built up in one's own mind or it is societal or within particular communities, that could be having an impact on whether people are actually taking the steps they need to to get this vital early diagnosis. Because if you take something like bowel cancer, for example, Mark, you know, if somebody presents with stage one bowel cancer, so early stage bowel cancer, their chances of survival are significantly statistically higher than somebody who presents with a stage four bowel cancer, for example. They presented a lot further down the line, it may have spread, and the treatment options are just far more minimal for that particular group of patients. So really, it is about that understanding of, of your body and symptoms. I, I, you know, there, there may be uh, other things going on with, with the rural community as well, and as much as, you know, a lot of cancer care and cancer treatment in New Zealand is centralised around, the, uh, you know, the urban areas and metropolitan areas. So, look, we don't really have statistics on it, but I think it, there was a, a report from our cancer agency that, that states, you know, it's reasonable to think that living in more remote rural areas, people are likely to experience barriers to early detection and treatment for that matter, because the simple fact they live further away from urban centres, where most of our cancer uh, services are based um, and where most of our clinical trials are held, for example. So I it's really incumbent on cancer services to try and reduce that inequity of access uh, and whether that's getting more services out into rural areas themselves or making sure that the transportation or the funding is provided for those that are living in rural areas to make sure they can access these treatments and, and diagnosis screenings at a much earlier time. Now, Liam, there's a lot of awareness uh, of, uh, I mean, let's call them the, the high profile, the superstars of cancers, if you like, the breast and prostate. Um, but it seems to me that more people die from gut cancers uh, than breast and prostate. Um, why haven't these gut cancers got more recognition in New Zealand when we seem particularly prone to them? I think there's a real stark reality about this, Mark. I think you can, we can sum it up with a statistic I heard at a conference that I was at recently. So thankfully, for every one breast cancer patient that sadly dies, nine will survive. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at pancreatic cancer as an example. For every one pancreatic patient that survives, nine will die. Okay. What does that mean? That means that for breast cancer, for prostate cancer, who have these 90 odd percent survival rates after five years, which is wonderful and fantastic mm -hmm. and what we should all aim for, that there are advocates in the community. 
There are people out there shouting from the rooftops about the treatment that they've had, about the fact that they survived because they got a screening, for example, for breast cancer, and it was caught at an early stage. We don't have those advocates for these cancers in a lot of cases. And that's why our role is so important as a voice for cancers of the digestive system and patients in New Zealand affected by gut cancers, because we need to take that role on. And that's one of the things we're trying to do, for example, with the Give It Up campaign that we're running, Mark, is we are trying to raise funds and, and raise that awareness, as you say, so that we can make sure that um, these cancers are much, much higher in the public consciousness. Because the reality is that there are things we can do to reduce our risks around them as well. So it's important that we're aware of the symptoms that I alluded to before and, and also the things we can do to perhaps reduce our risk of developing these cancers in the first place. Now, are there things rural New Zealanders and rural men in particular can do to perhaps reduce the risk of being affected by gut cancer? Yeah, look, I think there are some overarching risks, some, some, some things we know that do increase the risk of, of gut cancers being developed. And, and the list would be smoking, for an example, excessive alcohol consumption, obesity, diets that are high in animal fat, diets that contain high amounts of salt, cure, pure, poorly preserved foods, and those that are low in fruit and vegetables as well. Um, so when we're talking specifically about the, the, the rural community, um, then there may be a conversation around diet and, and uh, animal fat, diets that are high in animal fat, for example, mm -hmm. and the need to perhaps balance that out a little bit. Um, and when we, when we talk about these things, what we're trying to impart is the importance of a balanced, healthy diet and healthy lifestyle. So we're not saying that anything should be cut out. I mean, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't drink, but that's not the case. So it's about reducing excessive alcohol consumption it's about balancing out if we if there is a diet that's heavy heavy in red meat and high in animal fat at the moment can we introduce some fish some chicken on the flip side of that mark you know it may be a presumption of mine to make but you may expect farming communities rural communities to, to have diets that are very high in fresh fruit and vegetables which is fantastic because that does decrease our risk and as we alluded to before you know physical exercise getting out and about every day working on the farm, for example, that's going to reduce our risk because it, it, it maintains a healthy body weight. It reduces obesity and it increases that exercise intake that we take every day. Um, but going back to that point before about being aware of those symptoms and listening to our bodies is, is really key. Mark. So my guest on Point of View is Gut Cancer Foundation's Executive Officer, Liam Willis. We'll take a look at uh, the developments in terms of diagnosis and uh, I guess the cure, what, uh, what treatment can be given, and so many other aspects of this in the next part of our programme. We're watching Point of View on Country TV, back in just a moment. Welcome back to Point of View, I'm Mark Leishman and my guest, the Gut Cancer Foundation's Executive Officer, Liam Willis. So Liam, we were talking in the first part um, about diet, etc. We'll get on to that in just a moment. But what about uh, developments in terms of diagnosis of gut cancers? So look, I mean, one of the recent developments that is really important is the introduction of the National Bowel Cancer Screening Programme. Um, so anybody aged between 60 and 74 can enroll on this program and get access to screening, um, which we hope will increase the number of early diagnoses, as we talked about before and, and, and how important that is. So that's one thing that's really a good thing, although we, we must say we would, we would like to see that reduced in age so that people over the age of 50 as, as, as a minimum can access it. Um, we know that bowel cancer is increasing in prevalence in 40 to 50 year olds, 50 to 60 year olds. So actually uh, rolling this program out much wider to a younger audience will, will see definite benefits. Um, when, when it comes to the other cancers we discussed and those that I mentioned earlier that are the cancers of the upper digestive system, one of the problems we have is that there is no diagnostic test. There's no screening program. And Whereas we look at the, the great progress that has been made in the likes of breast and prostate cancer over the last 20 years with survival rates increasing, a lot of that is due to access to great new diagnosis and, and screening programs. And we just don't have that for, for, for these cancers. You know, if we're able to identify somebody is in a particularly high risk group, 
we may be able to put them in, in, in they may have access to screening and monitoring, um, but it's not an early diagnosis tool necessarily. So it's really important that, that, that we continue to support the research um, that is going into um, diagnostic tests for uh, uh, cancers such as pancreas cancer, for example, um, which we have done through clinical trials here that we funded at the Gut Cancer Foundation. Uh, and that's really key because that's the way that we will improve these survival rates. What about, we've got the diagnosis, what about the, the treatment? Uh, can it be treated? Uh, I mean, presumably, if you get onto it early, you've got a much better chance. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the golden rule, most definitely. Um, the earlier we catch these cancers, the, 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 the better the outcomes are, go are going to be. Um, one of the issues, as I said before, we do have with the upper uh, gut cancers is that often they aren't diagnosed until quite late. And then the treatment options are, are pretty limited. Um, so whilst we are seeing improvements, incremental improvements in treatments, and there are a number of bits of research and clinical trials that are ongoing to try and improve outcomes for these various patients. The reality is that outcomes haven't improved very much for this group of cancers. Um, treatments haven't progressed in the manner that we would like them to, especially when you compare them with other cancers, other groups of cancers here in New Zealand. So again, the, the, the importance on being able to fund uh, uh, and give access for Kiwis to, to clinical trials is is really, really key. And, and, and that's one of the things that we really concentrate here in, in, New, in, in gut, at the Gut Cancer Foundation on. What does, um, I guess, the latest research say about, I know, you know, high meat has always been, uh, meat uh, uh, intake, if you like, has always been an issue in New Zealand, and I guess more especially in the rural areas where it's uh, easily accessible. Um, what does the latest research say about that? And I guess high sugar as well, high sugar diets. Yeah, so look, with high sugar diets, they are one of the biggest contributing factors to obesity. And we know that um, obesity will increase the risk of, of most of these cancers, of these cancers of the digestive system, without a doubt. Um, I, you know, you can look to certainly something like pancreatic cancer, which is increasing in prevalence. And there's a direct link there, really, with the increase in, in, in diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes that we're seeing in, in New Zealand as well, and as much as both are a result of um, high sugar diets, um, uh, diets that are high in uh, salted, cured, purely preserved foods. These all have contributory factors in, in raising the risks of, of, of developing one of these cancers. And, and that is the case as well with a diet that's very high in animal fat um, and maybe something that that um, be particularly prevalent for people in, in rural communities to consider. Um, again, I, you know, we're not necessarily advocating we cut everything out of our diets but it's about understanding that a healthy lifestyle a healthy balanced diet that includes really good consumption of of fresh fruit and vegetables good exercise levels maintaining a healthy body weight will all contribute to being able to reduce our risk of, of developing these cancers whether it's actually in urban areas or, or rural areas as well now your gut cancer foundation recently gave more than eighty thousand dollars i understand for a new clinical trial um, can you tell us a bit about the trial and what makes it different and how possibly it can help long term? Yeah, sure. So this is the uh, ASCEND clinical trial. And this is a, a trial that, the, that is looking at a new treatment option for a group of patients who really have very limited options at the moment. And we're talking here about patients with pancreatic cancer that is both advanced and metastatic. So that's they've been diagnosed with a, a pancreatic cancer that has spread to another organ in their body. And this is a terminal cancer. There is, there is no cure for these cancers. And the reality is that somebody that's diagnosed at this stage, on average, has 11 months to live. The prognosis is really, really poor. So one of the reasons for that is that pancreas cancer is actually really difficult to treat um, with chemotherapy. And, uh, and that's because it has a physicality to it where it builds a barrier almost. The non-cancerous cells a really hard scar barrier around the tumour. So the aim of chemotherapy is to get this treatment into the cancer cells, kill the cancer cells and reduce the size of the tumour and the spread of the tumour. But because the cancer cells with pancreas cancer are, are protected to an extent, what we find is that this chemotherapy actually just doesn't infiltrate the cells that it needs to. What this study is doing is looking at adding a new form of uh, delivery drug. It's called, like, it's called SEND1. 
Uh, and basically what this drug does, you give it to somebody before they start chemotherapy and it effectively punches holes in the, in the outside of the tumor, uh, in the cells that are protecting it. And what does that do? Well, it allows us to then give the dose of chemotherapy, which gets into where it needs to go. So it's getting to infiltrate the cells, the cancer cells themselves, so that the treatment has an opportunity to work, whereas before it perhaps will go through the body, make you feel ill because that's what chemotherapy does, and then not have any impact on the tumor cells that, that, that we want. So actually, you know, the, the, the people that have initiated this, these trials in Australia, they, they think this is seriously groundbreaking and really exciting research for a group of patients that currently are severely under under treated or under, don't have the options available for treatment. So what we've been able to do, one of the issues in New Zealand is um, that our clinicians would love to get patients onto these clinical trials. So this in particular was started in Australia, um, but the funding models are different. So whilst the hospitals over in Australia may provide the funding needed for participation in the trial, that money doesn't carry over here. And there's a deficit that needs to be met. So we have the clinicians coming to, to our cells uh, and asking to see if we can help meet that funding gap, which we've only been able to do, of course, because of the generosity of our, our donors and our supporters. So we've been able to provide this funding. And, and what's been interesting, I think, from a rural perspective is the initial application for this study was centred around Auckland, as a lot of clinical trials are, you know. Um, but we were keen to see if we could get a wider wider spread and, and wider accessibility. So we went back to the investigators and asked if there's anybody else interested. And we've managed to be able to find the funding so that patients in Auckland, Waikato and Dunedin um, will, will be able to access um, a limited number. will be able to access this trial from early this year moving onwards. So we hope that that will have an impact for the rural community and, and patients who fit that group of eligibility for this trial being able to access it in a way they wouldn't have been able to before. Now, I know you've mentioned uh, numerous times through this little chat uh, the role of diet and exercise, balance and all things, uh, which reduces the risk of gut cancer. So you've set up a new campaign, which you mentioned before, Give It Up. Tell us about Give It Up. Yeah, so Give It Up is our annual fundraising and awareness campaign. I'm sure many people have heard of dry July or November, and the principle's similar. What we're asking to do is, we're asking Kiwis, we're setting them the challenge of giving up either the sofa, um, alcohol, or sugar for the month of March. Um, and all they need to do is go to giveitup.nz, sign up, create their fundraising page, and ask their friends, their family, their whanau to support them by making donations to support them with their challenge of giving up either sugar, sofa or alcohol throughout the whole month of March. Now, this is really important to us for two reasons. One is that, as we've alluded to, you know, we need to meet the funding gap for clinical trials for these cancers in New Zealand. We need to be able to raise the awareness of the symptoms, both amongst rural and urban communities. We can only do that with fundraising. We don't receive any government support. Every bit of every cent we get comes from the public. So it's a really key fundraising effort in that regard. But secondary, as we've talked all the way through this interview, Mark, you know, the importance of a healthy, balanced diet is key to reducing risk. So what we're doing is we're partnering with um, uh, experts in the field who will be able to support those fundraisers who are taking on the challenge to give them the tools that they need to be successful in March, giving it up. But what we really want to see is actually give them the tools to have this sustained long-term lifestyle changes that actually will, will help them on a day-to-day -day basis, but also reduce their risk of developing a gut cancer as well. And one of the really, really heartwarming things about last year's campaign was we raised $100,000, which is fantastic. Managed to use that money to fund a couple of clinical trials, but also the stories we got back from people who undertook that fundraising about how their lives have changed because they have been able to kick their sugar habit. Now they've lost weight, they're out exercising every day. And these were things that they just weren't doing necessarily before the campaign. So to be able to have that dual impact of raising the money and, 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 and tooling people up, raising the awareness of the importance of this, this lifestyle is really key to our mission, our vision and everything that, that we want to do here. Um, and look, it's, it's a campaign that, that anybody anywhere in the country can get involved in, be it urban or rural. It's an online campaign. All the advice, all the support that we give is done online. 
through 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 Facebook groups, through our website, through blogs, through emails. It doesn't matter whether you're in, in the most rural bit of, of, of New Zealand or in or in, in an S city. It's accessible to everybody and we welcome everybody and encourage everybody to get involved. Thank you so much, uh, Liam Willis, who is the Gut Cancer Foundation's Executive Officer. Keep up the good fight, Liam, um, and well done on doing a, a great job. And uh, well, let's hope for good news for the future. So we'll have another point of view at the same time next week here on Country TV. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then.